So as you see from the title, this is a further analysis of interesting shaping examples. So we have to start with, well, what is shaping? So shaping is the um, curvilinear motions, the up and down motions at the keyboard. And Mrs. Taubin used to refer to that as the glue that puts the whole technique together. If you want a want 30 second um, kind of explanation of what the Taubman work is, it deals with alignment and it deals with movement. So we have to line our body up in a certain way to use this instrument. And then we have two jobs to do. We have to put a key down and we have to move left and right unless we're satisfied with pieces that only play one note. So since we have this challenge that we have to put keys down and move side to side, what Mrs. Talvin discovered was really the most efficient and natural motions that move us efficiently left and right and in and out of the keyboard. So we have different categories of motions and these motions, like any good machine, work together. So even though I'm focusing on shaping, I will be also mentioning other aspects of what make the passage successful. So what you can start to see is that we work very much in choreography and the combination of choreography. And I always like to include when I say that, that all of this only works if it's in a certain proportion to each other. And what do I mean by that? We could have a bag of parts that says wristwatch on the outside, but all of those parts could come from different wristwatches. You will not be able to assemble that wristwatch well because the parts are not in the right size in relationship to each other. And that's actually a very kinesthetic aspect of our work. When we train somebody, we're not only training somebody to do the movements, we're training somebody to do the feeling of the movements and the size of the motion and the combinations of motion. And what, em what emerges as a result of that is an ability to feel that you can play unencumbered. And it's very much like how coordination works in, in other things. When we learn to ride a bicycle, we are focusing on many different components. We're focusing on how to steer. We're focusing on how to pedal. But at a certain point, you get this phenomenon called balance, and then you're simply riding. It's a wonderful, exhilarating experience. And in fact, once you have a coordination in your body, it is very odd to tune in or focus in on any single component. Next time you're riding a bicycle, ask yourself the question, what are my feet doing? And suddenly it feels very strange because you're tuning into something that's very automatic. At the piano, when the motions are properly learned and properly combined and are in the right proportion and they're placed on the keyboard in certain ways, what emerges is this kind of feeling like it's moving itself. So in a, just a nutshell, that's kind of what we're talking about today. I'm going to highlight shaping. I wanted to give you um, two categories. One is what is shaping and then how it's done and how it's best done. Uh, what shaping, like I said, it's a movement of the finger, hand, and forearm. And it's initiated by the forearm and the hand. And it varies the landing heights. A very good example of this would be if we took a B major scale. If you took a B major scale and descended and had no shaping, it would look like this. You can also hear that it sounds very monochromatic. But once the finger, hand, and arm begin to sense that they can land at different heights, you have fluctuation in sound. So you can see the difference between something like this and something like this. Besides the fact the second one was a little faster. But the point is that you can hear already that there's a different timing of the keyboard. And this is what Talvin was talking about, the glue, and also the interpretive glue, the ability to color and time music is very dependent on shaping. So here are some things to know about shaping. Shaping has been in the sort of mainstream of teaching for forever. But it isn't always properly taught, meaning it's initiated very often from the wrong parts of the mechanism. One very characteristic place that people ask people to shape from, which is not correct, is to shape from the upper arm, to do very big motions with the upper arm. Now, the upper arm is moved by very slow moving muscles. They're not very efficient and they tire very easily. So 
The other aspect of shaping from the upper arm is that it pulls the weight off the bottom of the key. So our goal is to stay on the keyboard, not off the keyboard. So if people are shaping from the upper arm, which is not the right place to shape from, that has an adverse effect on feeling in control at the instrument. The other common place is the wrist. People are taught that the wrist has to be flexible and fluid and all of this. So people are taught to shape from the wrist, up and down wrist motions. Well, we know even from our talk with Mary that the finger, hand, and arm have to be connected and aligned. The minute one of those fulcrums goes out of alignment, we, don't, we no longer have a connection of the finger to the hand to the arm. So that's why shaping has to be an effort from the forearm and the hand that just lands higher and lower. I like to equate it very much to the experience of going up a staircase. When you go up a staircase, you put your foot up a little higher than this next stair. But in that moment, you're stepping down on that stair and your entire body is at a new elevation. So here, the reality is the key has to be played down. So when I play down to the B flat, I'm also at a higher elevation. So when we put those elevations and landing heights next to each other, they start to form a kind of curve. In this five finger position going down, we would label this as an overshape. So as I go into the examples, I will be using the term overshape. This is what I'm referring to. It gets higher toward the middle in this instance and comes back to the thumb. Shapes never go below level of the keyboard because if they go below the level of the keyboard, that's where the wrist is going to activate and not, not be able to connect the fingers to the hand to the forearm. There's also the boundary. I can't go just as high as I can go because then I don't feel rested down. So I have to realize that shaping has boundaries. It's not just a blanket movement in any size. It has to be the size that facilitates the ease of the passage, no more and no less. So that has to be sensed. When we go in the opposite direction, we can also do an overshape. We can go higher to the middle of the figure and down. So this is a classic five finger over shape. Um, I won't go into the technical details of how we determine shaping, but just to give you an idea that we do deal with shaping very specifically in terms of how many notes are in the shape and where the high points are. We also have the ability to go laterally across the instrument. And this is what we would term an undershape. Undershape meaning just a slight slight curve down like this. Not a big, you know, smile, but more of a lateral experience that smooths out the experience. So if I have a broken chord, one of the key um, shaping designs is that I can go under and I can go over on the way back. So this is a classic under shape, over shape situation. Now, if I change that design even a little bit, I also have to consider that shapings change. So shapings change for various reasons, and one of the reasons is it changes because of fingering. If I decide to do this and come back to my thumb, I can no longer do an undershape, and I'll show it here. Because um, when I do an undershape, and I need to go back to my thumb. The undershape has brought my thumb all the way to the left side, and then suddenly I would have to twist back to my thumb. So we know we can't twist. That produces injuries, limitations, all kinds of problems. So then this becomes what's termed one overshape. I'm just doing one overshape that ends on the thumb. Can you see that my thumb no longer travels over here to get back here? So we try to analyze shapes so that we move minimally, so that we don't not moving all over the instrument. I, for one, was taught to shape very much from the upper arm, and I was taught to imagine that it was a sea and waves, and the more I did it, kind of the happier my teacher was until it started to sound really bad. <laughs> but I thought I was doing a good job because I just kept doing more of what she was asking me to do. So what started out as kind of nice became this, I had no control any longer. So you can see that shaping can be a magical thing and it can 
actually, excuse me, it can be a very detrimental thing to the play. Let's talk about another shaping design that I'll use, which is the shape that we use in a scale. So one of the main concerns in scale playing is how do I comfortably get my thumb to cross under? So when, we, when we're talking about the thumb crossing under, if I have no shape, I can do everything right, but my thumb has no space to get to here. The minute I begin to go a little bit higher to the second finger and a little bit higher to the third finger, I now have a lot of space for my thumb to be able to come back down to level. So we call this a scale shape. Any cross under, whether it's in the right hand or the left hand, and any scale that you're playing has this design. So if there's any one thing you can take away and go try from today is knowing that you always have to have space for that thumb. If I, did, if I got lower, you see where my thumb is? I'd have to make a big, huge, sudden motion to get to my thumb. So here is a classic scale shape, helps us cross under. So even with this little bit of kind of information about shaping, uh, I think we can begin to kind of explore some things. So the reason I chose some of these passages uh, is, is I want to say not to create new rules. So I would say that these are not new rules, these are not um, new categories. They're just observations of some things that showed up in very specific passages, but they came very much from passages my students brought to me and asked me questions about the shape or had analyzed the shape in a different way. So I wanted to give some uh, context for how I chose these examples. And the reasons why my students chose different shaping solutions, and we can maybe learn, learn a little bit from that scenario. So if we look at the example one from the Brahms Sonata, uh, and we go to the last measure there, we begin to realize that the, it, shaping doesn't take care of everything. Shaping take care, takes care of some things, but not everything. So the first thing it doesn't take care of is it doesn't take care of where our body needs to be. So if this passage is located here, I need to adjust my torso, which is sitting on the front part of the bench, over to the left. It feels extremely uncomfortable to, to have students be fixed in one place. When you fix a student in one place, you're actually limiting the amount of natural coordination that they can find on their own. So in this case, very often by the time somebody comes to something like this, they've been sensitized to it, but sometimes a, a friendly reminder of where your torso is can be very helpful. So move here, the first thing I would say if we're going to the last measure in example one is to um, move the torso to the left a little bit. Now, when I move my torso to the left, I'm not only moving only left. I'm moving left and slightly forward. Why? When I move left like this, I feel like the teapot that's going to tip over. When I move left and a little bit forward, I just feel grounded in the place that I need to be. Okay. So our first challenge here is we're going to play a chord and then we're going back to the same chord that repeats twice. Now, we have left-right motions, which are called rotations, and we have a rotation that Mary was talking about, the single rotation. The single rotation is a rotation that just keeps going left and right. It goes, plays and moves in the opposite direction. This is somewhat familiar to even people not associated so deeply with our work because you can see it in things like trills. You can see that the arm is turning. Well, we actually have a rotation between every note that is ever written, which is daunting and wonderful at the same time. So when we play the chord, we cannot rotate to the outside of the hand. So the rotation comes toward the thumb side to play straight down. Now, that probably won't be a problem for the first chord, but when we're coming from this thumb and coming to this chord, what's very common is that this falls over to the right. When you play to the outside of the hand any more than one note, you're off balance. So the balance of that chord is something I would check in someone's hands. So they're coming here, and then the balance of that chord plays toward the thumb side, but it goes straight down, so I'm not tilting it over. I'm coming from that side to play straight down, and then it's a double rotation to play again. So 
as I make these motions very small, you won't see them. So I'm making them larger so you can actually see them. Can you see the adjustment? And then I go back to the single note. So in terms of the rotation, we have to make sure that the chords are balanced. In terms of the in and out, we have to always consider how do we move forward and back from the instrument, and very often it has a relationship to our thumb. So our thumb being the shorter finger has to 99.9% .9 of the time move in toward the fall. So when we have this chord, the chord is actually played in the direction of our body, and the single note is played in the direction of the piano. So this is toward our body, toward the piano. Then the two chords actually come toward ourself. And if the more advanced and subtle people who understand this, the second chord is called an out forward because it propels us back to the thumb. So you can see that that action, as small it is, as it is, is necessary. If I don't have in and out, I feel very frozen. I feel like it can't move. Okay, shaping-wise, the reason I chose this example it's a very good example of the shaping coming down to the thumb after the main beat, and then shaping from one occurrence of the thumb to the next. Very often people, and I think actually my theory is a little bit, it's associated with years and years of playing with a metronome, that the click becomes representative of a down, of physical down, which also ruins musical play. I'm very anti-metronome. Um, but, but in this context, what happens here is that the beat is not actually the lowest point. I'm coming a little bit down to the thumb, and then I have a shape which is one, two, three, four notes. So the high point is somewhere in between those two chords, and I'm coming back down. Can you see that slight undulating? I don't want to really exaggerate because it's not, it's not, a, not, not representational of what's really going on. doesn't change as I go to the other figures. So that's what's happening there. Very similarly, in a, a Chopin impromptu, the next example is functioning the same way. Very interesting because the shaping that came to me from the student actually was a shaping according to the meter, which we do sometimes. But in this situation, it doesn't work so well. It's, it's the same principle. I'm basically coming down to the thumb, and then it's an overshape to the next occurrence of the thumb. And that's what those markings, when we write those, those things that look like phrase markings, they're actually not phrase markings. They're markings of shaping. So I always ask my students when they go to play for someone else to please bring a clean copy because I don't want them to think I have the strangest phrasing in the world. Because the phrasing doesn't necessarily go with what we have to do physically. The phrasing is the phrasing. We have to make it sound as we want it to. But that does not necessarily mean that it correlates with shaping. So what, one of the interesting things for the more advanced people here to always is a wonderful game to play in because you always have to kind of manage these, these different things next to each other. You have to manage the pulse against the groupings, <coughs> against the shapings, and really all of that doesn't necessarily always begin and end in the same way. So you can have a shape that ends a certain place and a grouping that ends on a note after it or something and it's going to come up. So I just want you to know that we have these systems, but these systems actually work perfectly together. They just don't work all at go and end at the same time. So it's wonderful. It's almost like I always think of it as that when I was a kid, they used to do this thing on the black on the screen where you draw on these things and then you, you put the plastic down and then you have another piece and you draw something else, like you're layering these things and then something emerges like a composite of all of that. And that's kind of what I'm trying to show here, that all of these things exist. So shaping is not the total answer, but it's a very important answer here because everything else could be correct 
and the shape is wrong and it won't feel so good and it won't be so controlled. Coming to the third example of this, this also came back and this is really where you can see how clearly the grouping is in three. We're grouping from what's called the denser sonority. Grouping is a way to organize notes, sometimes just by the meter, but sometimes other categories. We have other categories of grouping. This particular grouping is the category of grouping from the denser sonority. So clearly, the two notes are more weight, so we need a certain sense of the forearm for this. And then we have two single notes. Okay, so what's happening here underneath? The beauty of piano technique, I think, is so amazing is because we don't actually see a lot of things. But there's a world of things happening under the surface, and I always, I still to this day, marvel at how Mrs. Talbot was able with such clarity to uncover what is really very difficult to see and even difficult to describe. But here what's happening is the first thing I would check in a student would be the walking hand and arm. Why would I try to deal with the walking hand and arm? The walking hand and arm is our main vertical component which helps put keys down. When the writing goes back and forth between denser and less dense sonorities, it's very easy for the arm not to get into one of those entities. Either it doesn't want to get into the interval very well, or it gets into the interval and the other notes the arm doesn't get into. So on a very subtle level, I would ask a student, so all the notes have their own down. So I would check that first. But if the student doesn't understand that there's grouping involved here, this can be actually a very, this is a very problematic passage. We can't connect really from this single note to this interval. First of all, if I try to connect, I'm stretching. We can't stretch. We have movements that take us sideways that help us not stretch. So the grouping here is actually in threes. So the last note is a note responsible for sending me over to the new interval. Can you, can you uh, imagine that? Okay. But it doesn't coincide with the shaping. The shaping is going to the thumb here, and then it's going to the next occurrence of the thumb. So it's one note past where the grouping starts. And if you made the grouping and the shaping symmetrical, then you would have this. I just can't play it. So that's, that's very much what's going on in these three examples. We can move on. Okay, then we, this is a, this, I chose this example because it was a little bit surprising to me actually. Because I was thinking, oh, the music is, looks so nicely in groups of four. Probably the shapes go in groups of four and my first uh, measure there confirmed it because this was, this was an over shape that came to here, and this was an undershape that came to here. So then I thought, oh, I have the code figured, and I just continued kind of like that. Let me do another overshape to here. Oh, maybe it's another overshape. Oh, that's funny, that's good, okay. And it kind of went like that, so something didn't feel very good. And when I sat with it and it felt very good, it was an issue where that entire second and third measure were one shape in and of itself. The reason why it ended up being that way, and I don't know if this would be for every situation like that, is the occurrence of the thumb. The thumb is happening once, twice, uh, once, second time, third time. So there are three thumbs in that measure. To come down fully to any of those thumbs made it not feel very smooth. So when I, when I did, it turned out that this was one shape for this measure and one shape for this measure. I ended on the thumb and I needed a tiny undershape to begin that trill because it didn't feel good to just start like this. That's how I tested it. So you can see, I, I'll try to play it with more shapes in the second and third measure than what's right, 
and you'll 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 see it's it's very awkward. <laughs> See, I'm going up and down in a way that doesn't look very smooth. So a nice example of something that was a little bit surprising. I wasn't expecting that whole measure to be one shape, but it turned out to be very nice. The next example, there's a wonderful lecture on um, the streaming that John Bloomfield gave uh, several years ago called um, It Looks the Same But Feels Differently. And this is a little bit in that vein because um, the expected shaping here that came to me, uh, a student of mine started to, to work on this, was to do it, and it, it felt very good, to do it in fours. It seemed very logical and felt very good in a slow tempo. The problem was that it went faster, it didn't feel so good. And we find that sometimes there's a, there's a shape that works slowly, feels very comfortable, but it actually doesn't work in speed. So we always have to find out what is the, the shaping that works in speed. Come to realize that the first, the first, entire first two measures are one shape. And then it goes into fours. Then one shape again, and then fours. So very interesting. And when you start to look a little closer, you see that there's actually some reason for it. The notes in the first part are very close to each other. Do you see the relative distance here? Let's go to the distances of the first group of four. Do you see how, do you see how far away those are from each other? So I think that's why the first part of the measure lends itself to one shape. Sorry. And then, like that. Is that is that clear for people? Yeah. Okay. I just have to have some water to. <laughs> okay. Moving on to the next example. So this was an example that. Uh, a student of mine brought several times, and I thought I was doing a really, really great job <laughs> <laughs> because I analyzed it very like the first measure. So the entire passage was analyzed like the first measure. And the problem with that is even though I thought I'd done a great job, he was still having difficulty with the passage. So I had to look a little bit further, and what I found was that this entire second measure is one shape. So it's very, uh, to the eye, these look like very consistent figures. But then when we got here, what the, the reason why was because the distances started to get wider and I had to move inside. So when I got wider, I had to continue the shape in order to ne negotiate the passage. So. It didn't work, it felt very busy. So this second measure is a complete one, one shape kind of thing. And it's because of the distances. There are other components involved with the success of the passage. One key thing here is the triggering. The left hand has to trigger into the right hand. With triggering, I can say briefly what I think might be relevant here is like when you go to a, to a doctor and they ask you to cross your leg and then they hit your knee with a mallet. You don't have a choice whether you're going to lift your leg or not. It's a reflex. It just happens. We want the left hand note to bring in the right hand note like a reflex. This just brings this in. And what's interesting here is don't let the rest fool you. The shape continues to the thumb. So the right hand shaping is one thumb to the next thumb. But right here, if you come fully, sorry, come fully down here, then you can't you can't get in here to this. So that's the reason for it. Okay, moving on to the next one. I chose this example because people might have a preference. Some people might prefer to begin this fugue 
with the right hand. Some people might prefer to begin the fugue with the left hand. I think both are, are fine, whatever, whatever somebody prefers to do. But we can't do the same thing just because it's right hand or left hand. It changes. So the, the fingering changes, the fact that we're in front of the body changes in a different way. Everything really changes. So there's a different solution. So if we look at the, the upper one, taking it from with the right hand, one of the key things that we know is that we cannot curl our fingers. So people who are here for the first time, we often do this in our first lecture, we ask people to, to curl their fingers. That's the classic piano position, you know, hold an orange, hold an apple, and now try moving them. And then we ask people to let their fingers out and move them and to feel the difference. And uh, we hope that people feel that being in a natural free position means that fingers move more easily. Well, here we have a little bit of a dilemma because if we start this piece and we have our beautiful piano hand, and that's the most important thing to us, then we would play it like this. And you can see I'm completely stuck inside the black here. So, being a scrappy young pianist, you think you, no problem, I have that figured out. I'll just curl my fingers and get away from that nasty part of the keyboard, which is heavy, and I'll just be like this. And that's sort of the beginning of the end, because once that happens, then everything behind it is tight. So, what Taubman found, and she found this through years and years of actually putting lipstick on her fingertips and playing passages and studying where she landed on the keyboard. And what started to emerge was this awareness that the finger hand and the forearm have the capability of moving toward the piano and toward ourselves. So in this instance, what can bring me out of that black key area and also not have me curl my fingers are the in and out motions. So I ha we have arrows. The arrows down mean that I'm coming toward my body. The arrows up mean I'm going in towards the fallboard. I'll never forget Margaret said years ago, oh, the down arrow is easy to remember. Just remember, down and out. If you're down and out in life, <laughs> it's gonna get better. So I always remember that. Um, anyway, so that we're coming, we're able to move the finger, hand, and arm out here. And do you see now I'm playing on the lighter part of the piano. I'm not stuck in here and I'm no longer curling. So you can see the in and out. In terms of shaping, What's happening here is what we, for the more advanced people, would call a numbered shape. So even though I'm going to the thumb, this is not the high point. It's not a, what I would call a bona fide crossing. It falls into the numbered shape. So with that, given we have different challenges if we decide to play this in the left hand. First of all, I can no longer be in the same torso position to the instrument. I have to move the torso to the right. In doing so, that makes room for my mechanism to feel comfortable in front of the body. Here, if I start with the, with the fifth finger, what happens is it becomes one very, very long shape. You see that if I try to do it, it's very awkward. If I try to do the shaping of the right hand, it's not going to work. So here we have one progressive shape that brings us to the thumb. So I thought it was a good example of something that was interesting, meaning that um, we can't just arbitrarily switch hands and then just do exactly what we did in one hand in the other hand. Uh, moving on to the Brahms uh, uh, example. So this is also realizing that the whole issue of playing octaves and chords, that's been resolved in someone's technique, that they know how to, to properly rebound off the instrument, properly fall into the instrument, and combine it with rotation. So in this example, what was interesting was that there was a, a undershape that was unexpected in a certain way. When I, when I start here with a three note overshape, it doesn't feel very good to just go purely up or purely down, because mostly also for musical reasons. So can you see I'm 
on the way up on that note. And that gives me the chance to continue as an overshape to the downbeat of the next measure. So, and you can hear that if I don't do that, if I don't do that undershape, it doesn't sound right musically. To me, it doesn't have any sort of lift to the music. And it's really just knowing that this slight undershape exists. I think I want to go to the Debussy example. Does anyone have a time? What time it is? 11.22. 11.22, okay. So we have time for one more. All right, so this uh, Debussy arabesque, for me on the page, looked so much, it was screaming under overshape. And in a certain way, it kind of facilitated it, but it never felt completely comfortable. And then, what, what I realized was that maybe the whole first thing was one overshape. And when I tried that, it felt amazingly better. So there's a subtle in and out here. I'm coming a little bit out. The thumb is always forward, never falls off the instrument. So you can see that the, the way the music looks, it looks like it wants to do this. And I don't know, I just felt not in quite control. The minute... So I think that's all we have time for today. But I hope that this begins to uh, give you a little bit more in the repertoire of solution to some shaping passages, realizing that the shaping works together with all the other elements, that it's not just doing shaping or just doing rotation, that the way the technique works is that everything works together and that there are sizes to things, proportions and boundaries. We can't just do movements in any size. So thank you. Maybe I can continue with the rest of them in another lecture.